Okay, well, what we were talking about, Richard, you asked me, well, you know, some people refer to um, algae in a, in a turf scrubber or whether it's in a refugium that some algae might release toxins into the water. And um, I said, yeah, you know, that's why, you know, they don't work. And if you don't change your water, everything's just going to crash. That's it. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you just play that and watch everybody in the uh, refugium and turf scrubber business go, damn you! <laughs> no. Um, as you know, looking at these aquariums, I, I use uh, algae to filter my aquariums to quite an extent. Um, and so if algae released toxins, I'd be concerned about it. Well, the truth is they do. Um, they, they leach substances that are called leachates and uh, certain algae like calerpa, if, if you've got a, a rhizome of calerpa grow across a coral, you can see the coral tissue will be damaged. Um, any creature, whether it's a sponge, a coral, a any creature living on the reef, they emit substances into the water that are harmful to their neighbors because it's a battle for territory. And algae are no exception. They're, they're releasing stuff in the water. Bacteria release stuff into the water. A lot of the substances that are released by uh, algae we refer to as DOC, dissolved organic carbon. They may be simple sugars. Um, they may be more complex uh, organic substances. And there is a researcher, his name is uh, Forrest Rower. And he's out in San Diego. He is a world-famous guy studying uh, microbialization in the seas and on coral reefs. Uh, he's looked at uh, microbes, bacteria, and viruses that can be found on reefs. And what he found was that on reefs where algae are um, in high uh, stock, a large standing stock of algae where the shift is more towards algae uh, instead of corals, uh, that is a uh, cascading effect because as the algae become dominant, they release DOC and you can measure it in the water. He's been able to just say, if we've got this organic carbon in the water, then we will find certain microbes and the corals will get disease and they will die. And it's tied to algae and organics. And hearing this or reading reports that he's written on it, you might go, well, wait a second. But I keep and grow corals in an aquarium and I'm using algae as an algae filter and the corals are thriving. That's a contradiction. Or maybe you, you, you have a reef aquarium and you've been carbon dosing, whether you're adding vinegar or you're adding uh, glucose uh, or methanol or you know any of these organic substances that people add uh, to control nutrient levels and the corals are thriving. They're not uh, going downhill. Well, I don't mean to discredit what Forrest Rower is talking about. I, what I'm trying to say here is that it's much more complex than a black and white issue to say algae are bad or dissolved organic carbon is bad. Um, it really gets down to um, what is actually happening. There is a lot to be studied and I think the contradiction uh, is the kind of thing that any scientist like myself uh, would look at and say, wow, um, this requires more study to really understand what is the process that Forrest has discovered and, and illuminated on the reef, what, what makes that work that way, and why isn't the same process happening in our closed system aquariums. Uh, so it would be neat if, if he could be um, introduced to the aquarium hobby and understand what it is that we're doing and and tie that to his own research. Maybe we'll touch upon that in a uh, future edition, a future video when we talk about algal turf filtration and refugia. We modify the respiration effects that happen because we have a basically a closed system, a small volume of water and a large volume of life, um, you can utilize the uh, process that Walter Aidey described um, in his book Dynamic Aquaria, uh, what's called reverse daylight photosynthesis to 
elevate pH and soak up the CO2 that accumulates at night due to respiration, also supply excess oxygen at night when it would otherwise be uh, depleted by the, all of the life in such a small body of water. And only algal filtration has that capacity. Sure, you can use Kalkwasser to elevate pH, but it doesn't do anything to your oxygen levels. Um, algal filtration, whether it's in a refugium or in a turf filter, uh, nighttime illu illumination covers all of those benefits, uh, including the nutrient control. Uh, so yes, I, I think algal filtration is, is great, a wonderful thing. Um, and you know, I think that uh, as I, along with Charles Delbeck, when, when we wrote our, our last book, The Reef Aquarium Volume 3, we um, sort of toned back what we had written in The Reef Aquarium Volume 1, where we were criticizing what Walter Aidy did, uh, because his systems really didn't grow corals very well. Uh, and it wasn't the algal filter that was the reason. What was the reason was he didn't recognize how much calcium and alkalinity needed to be added to the system. He was using calcium carbonate, which is barely soluble. Um, barely soluble in, a, in the aquarium itself, and barely soluble if you run um, tap water or reverse osmosis water over it. You're going to get a little bit of calcium carbonate in solution, but not enough to supplement to maintain coral growth. Uh, so that was the, the main failing of the original systems that he had at the Smithsonian, it wasn't the turf uh, scrubbers. Um, they, they really do work very, very well at maintaining nutrient levels and at uh, balancing the, the oxygen and CO2 uh, that are strongly influenced by um, photosynthesis and respiration uh, in, the, in the aquarium. So the question was, can a, a, a refugium, and, and you added the little detail of well-balanced and it doesn't matter, uh, take the place uh, or complement a protein skimmer? And so I would answer that by saying, first of all, protein skimmers are one of the most um, efficient and effective means of filtration for an aquarium, but absolutely not essential. Did I say that? <laughs> so that means you can set up an aquarium and run it for years and years without a protein skimmer, okay? But that aquarium probably would be better and easier to manage with a protein skimmer. Got it? <laughs> so it's not a required piece of equipment, but it's one that definitely makes aquarium keeping better and easier. Uh, can you substitute that with a refugium? Yep, because you don't even need a refugium. You can run your aquarium without a refugium. Now, that, even that's a little complex subject. If you look at a, a video that I think you can find online now where I debated with um, Jake Adams on you know, the use of refugium versus not. The truth is every aquarium has a refugium somewhere, whether it's in the plumbing, any filters, has got areas that are biological filters and are refugia. Um, so, but to be more precise, when you talk about a refugium, that typically that is a separate aquarium of a certain size, typically a third or a half the size of the main display aquarium. And you can run an aquarium without a refugium, but it is uh, definitely a more stable, better aquarium with a refugium. So can you substitute a protein skimmer with a refugium to some extent and what happens in that case the sand if your refugium has a sand bed the bacteria in that sand bed will biologically decompose the organic substances that the protein skimmer would be pulling out um, so the organics actually just go to carbon dioxide but some of the substances phosphate for example accumulate they end up uh, in the substrate. If the refugium is growing algae, they go to the substrate and then into your calerpa or into your ketomorpha, and then you harvest and throw them out. So that's the way that a refugium uh, substitutes a protein skimmer. You need that export, because a skimmer really exports very well. And it does so before the organics are biologically broken down. Uh, and in that way, uh, you limit some of the acidification that comes from 
biological mineralization of organic substances. Um, so skimmers are really very efficient, very useful tool, but you can run an aquarium without it. Can you run an aquarium with a refugium and a skimmer? Absolutely, you can. What will you notice? Um, the refugium will reduce, uh, typically reduce the output of the skimmer because the bacteria in a sand bed compete for the same organic substances that the skimmer is pulling out. So if you have a large sand, deep sand bed in a refugium, the skimmer is not going to produce as much. If you're using a turf filter, the skimmer may actually produce more because uh, although the turf algae uh, compete with bacteria for ammonia, um, turf algae leach organic substances that are skimmable. Okay. Turf algae don't break down organic substances from the water, they produce them. So with a turf filter alone, your skimmer uh, will be enhanced, it'll, it'll do more. If you've got a refugium for growing calerpa, the deep sand bed is going to compete with the skimmer and actually reduce the, the production. That may be balanced to some extent by the leachates that come out of the calerpa if you're growing it. Well, I mean, the turf algae are actually better than keto. They grow faster. And so if, as long as you're taking that screen and scraping it, you're, you're getting a um, more efficient removal of, of ammonia, nitrate. Yeah, that's it. If you have a large keto ball and it's growing real well, that could be higher capacity than a small turf scrubber. Got it? But it's all, it's relative. I was going to make a joke, but I can't. <laughs> you got the red light district and the, yeah, no. Um, you know, I don't think anybody knows that, uh, an answer for that because ev you wouldn't be able to generalize green versus red. Uh, there are many types of red seaweeds. There are red turfs. Uh, I think most of the turf algae that you'll get long term in, a, in an aquarium um, are actually reds um, but there are prominent dominant ones that are common uh, that are green like uh, enteromorpha, uh, uh, cladophora, uh, ketomorpha, those are common ones but the, the reds are as far as number of species um, uh, they dominate turfs on reefs uh, and they're the more palatable. That's what fish like to eat is red algae. Uh, and red algae are not necessarily red in color. They could be brown, they could be blue. Uh, some red algae are actually green in color, but they are in the, that uh, taxonomical group of rhodophyta. Um, so whether one is better than the other, it's hard to say. I can tell you that um, red algae uh, release a lot of interesting organic compounds uh, into the water. Um, they also uh, utilize more iodine uh, than the greens do. So, um, you know, iodine supplementation is kind of important in a re reef aquarium and especially if you're growing red macroalgae or red, red turf. Um, a, a lot of the substances that you can smell in the ocean are organic substances released by red seaweeds. They include uh, iodine and they include uh, bromine as well. Uh, and they have interesting biological activities. You could look this up. These are things that I, you know, uh, you can do Google searches on this forever and ever if you're a nerd like me who's interested in reefs and in, in marine botany. Um, when you go uh, to the ocean here is you could go to the Keys uh, when some of the seaweeds are washing up this time of year in winter you can just pick them up and smell them. It's that fresh wonderful smell of the sea. Uh, it's what I like when I eat uni at a Japanese restaurant there because the sea urchins feed on that red seaweed. Uh, that very strong ocean smell is uh, bromine and iodine compounds uh, and it comes from the seaweeds. Uh, green algae don't don't produce that. It's a totally other uh, assortment of things that they, they release and it doesn't smell that way. It smells more uh, sulfury, um, completely different.
Yeah, I think, I think they have a valid point. I mean, for most people, growing a mangrove is sort of an aesthetic decision. It's something that looks beautiful, right? But a lot of people grow mangroves because they want to utilize them for nutrient control. And if that's the case, then they either need a very large mangrove tree like that one, which is, you know, as I mentioned to you, at least 15 years old, um, or uh, they use a large number of the mangrove propagules, uh, you know, what people typically buy is, is the propagule itself that's got two or three, two or four leaves on it and it's just started to root. Um, one of those is, is just not going to compete with macroalgae or turf filter. It's, it's a much slower process of nutrient uptake. But if you had 50 or 100 of those, you know, you fill a refugium and you've got all of those roots and the water's flowing through there, then yeah, it's going to compete with a, an algal filter. Um, and not only for nitrate, but also for phosphate. It's quite effective. So that's the answer. Awesome. It's a, a matter of scale and quantity. Yeah. Bears saying that uh, really it's low tech. Think of the investment, you know, putting 100 mangroves into a system and flowing water through it, as opposed to, you know, carbon dosing and protein skimming and. Um, you know, with turf filters, you got to be scraping, right? <laughs> with the mangroves, yeah, you know, maybe you need to spray them once in a while. For the red mangrove, you really don't. Only black mangrove gets the salt on the leaves, and you got to spray them. The only reason you would need to spray red mangroves is if you had something splashing and it was spraying salt onto them, then you'd need to wash them. Uh, but other than that, you're really just uh, maybe pruning them once in a while to keep them from growing up into the lights. So it's pretty low tech. Um, might cost you a fair bit to have that many. Of course, in Florida, we can go out and collect them. But for somebody in the middle of the country having to buy them, that, that could be expensive, but it's a one-time purchase. Bye, everybody. So long. <laughs> Enjoy your reef aquariums. And um, see you next time.